will now start to talk about the theory of PCA and we will explain the PCA model in a few different ways using projections or using what could be called common profiles principle. The first papers on PCA appeared already in 1901 and a few even before that. It was Harold Hotelling that formulated the PCA theory as we know it today uh, already in 1933. But it was only after the PC was developed that PCA became extensively used. PCA we use for analyzing one data set and that means one matrix or one table of data. And we use the convention that the samples are held in different rows so that would be the number of observations and the variables are the individual columns of that matrix. There's only one equation that you need to know in PCA. This equation x equals t times p transposed plus e will also be very helpful to have an understanding of when learning other multivariate methods. It's a very basic principle uh, that it is expressing. The data are held in the matrix X. The T is a matrix that contains the scores, P the loadings, and E would then be the residuals, the unexplained part of the data. Graphically, we can express it in this way. The scores and the loadings have F columns, where F would be the number of components, a number that is chosen by the user. So what we've seen so far were two component models. So in that case, the score matrix T would have two columns, and the loading matrix P would have two columns, or P transposed would have two rows. The residual matrix is the same size as the original data. The scores are held in the matrix T and the loadings in the matrix P. And they are determined in a least square sense and the number of components that are determined is, de is decided by the use. Each principal component or latent variable consists of one score and one loading vector. Component number one, the first column of T and the first column of P, has the highest possible variance. Component number two is orthogonal to this component and has the next highest variance, etc., etc., for additional components. Here's an example of a free variable data set. So X has three columns, and in this uh, case, it has 50 observations, 50 samples. So because there are only three variables, we can plot them in a coordinate system, and we see that there's some structure in the data. And we can describe, in this case, almost perfectly the variation in these three different variables by a plane, so a two-dimensional um, coordinate system. And that plane, if we project all the points into the plane, is exactly our score plot. It consists of two axes, one for the first principal component and one for the second principal component. The first principal component is the one that best explains the data, so it's the component that has the maximum variance, and the second component is orthogonal to that one and the one that best explains the yet unexplained part of the data. Something that we haven't discussed um, up till now is pre-processing of the data. In PCA we normally censor the data initially. This is an operation that simply helps PCA focus on the variation between the samples instead of focusing on the absolute level of the variation. And if you think about it, if you have a set of variables or one variable that would be one, two and three for three different samples, and if you have another set of uh, another variable which would be 101, 2 and 3, 
Well, basically the information you get from that is more or less the same. The variation between the samples is exactly the same. So when we censor the data, we, sort, we just move the coordinate system so that it is in the middle of the whole um, data cloud. We do that by centering each individual column of the data matrix. So we subtract the average from every column of X. The first loading, as I said before, is the direction in this three-dimensional space which has the highest variance. That's the direction where the points projected uh, onto the direction has the highest variance. The second component is then the direction orthogonal to that with the highest variance and the third component in this case would be given perfectly uh, because it is a three-dimensional data set. So another way to interpret the PCA model is that we rotate the original three axes and then we truncate them. We remove the directions in which there is only a little bit of variation because we assume that that will then be noise. The scores, well the scores we read or can read from the loadings from the projection of a sample onto the loading. The further out on that loading the data projects, the higher the score is, either positive or negative depending on the direction. So it's similar to how you read a value on a normal coordinate. Let's describe PCA in a slightly different way. We will use continuous data, spectra, because that will help us make the point made. This is a data set consisting of approximately 300 individual variables, but they are continuous because they are fluorescent spectra. They are measured by sending in light in a sample, in this case light with a wavelength of 240 nanometers, meaning a certain color, and then we measure at many different wavelengths the light that is, that is emitted from the sample. And that tells us something about the chemistry of that particular sample. In this case, it's a sugar sample. So every line plot here in this plot is one individual sample and a number of measurements, a number of different variables measured on that individual sample. First, we do a centering. And centering just means subtracting the average from every column. That means subtracting the average spectrum from the data. And here you can see the raw data and the censored data. The average of every column in the censored data would now be zero. Here we see the first component from PCA on the censored data. There are only three of all the different samples shown. The blue one on top, the red one in the middle, and the green one in the bottom. From each of those original spectra, we have subtracted the mean spectrum. So what we're trying to describe with PCA, with the first component, is the average spectrum. The first component will give us a loading, and that loading will be the shape that is best able to describe all the variation, all the shapes in all the different samples. So the first loading is common for all the samples. The score value would be the amount of this spectrum, of this common profile, in each of the individual samples. So we see that for the first blue sample, the score value is written as 86 next to the loading vector. For the red sample, the score is minus 432, and for the green one, it's 344. So we see that the scores, they differ for every sample, whereas the loading is what they have in common. And when we subtract, for example, from the first sample, 86 times the loading from the average spectrum, then we get the residual, the part that has not been explained. If these residuals are high, well, then we can extend it and extract one more principal component. 
here we have the scores and then we can extract the second component which is then a spectral profile which is orthogonal to the first loading and which best describes the remaining variation in the data and for that component we also get individual score values for every sample and we can extract in this way as many components as we like until we believe that there's no more systematic variation in the data and we'll get back to that point uh, a little bit later here we see the scores of the first sample for these first two components 86 and 104 now we can plot all these score values in a score plot if we and do so well then we can plot for example for the first sample 86 and 104 and we can do that for all the remaining samples and in this case we get a score plot like this and we clearly see a grouping here the grouping is due to sugar samples from different uh, sugar plants so that means that we have actually here shown that we are able to take sugar measure it with fluorescence spectroscopy and then we are able to distinguish between different sugar plants here's a plot of principal component 1 and 3 and you can see that as opposed to principal component 1 and 2 that we saw before we get an even better distinction when we use principal component 3 instead of 2 this way of explaining PCA saying that PCA finds common profiles and then the amounts of these common profiles that can be used for any kind of data it is very appealing for continuous data like this because it's very clear to show these shapes and how they relate to the original data but just as an example we will show a discrete data set that also pertains to the same sugar samples in this case instead of the spectra we will use lab measurements that were made on these very same samples we have 10 different chemical variables of chemical and physical variables like color, ash content, size, etc. In this case we can see that these different variables are measured on very different scales and as PCA is trying to describe the variation in the data we have to do something about the scaling. If we don't do anything about the scaling well then the model will focus on color and invert because those have the highest variance so implicitly if we don't do anything about it we will specify beforehand that variables such as size and clarity are not at all important because they have small numbers simply the scaling usually used is called unit variance scaling it's also sometimes called auto scaling when we use it together with censoring when we do auto scaling and that means centering and scaling by the standard deviation well then the data as you can see look very confusing but what we have done now is that we have put all the variables on equal footing that is all the variables have the same chance of entering the model of taking part in the model and it is then the common structure in the data that will define which variables are included to what extent as a side you can note that it doesn't matter whether you scale first and center or center first and scale the principle will the result will be exactly the same 